All right, welcome back to track one. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about relay and replay attacks on NFC. Uh, this is Lian and Salvador, so stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's quite a big introduction, and we realize we're now the single thing that's holding you from your lunch, so we really appreciate you coming to hear us talk. It's a real pleasure to be in Troopers. Personally, it's my second year in a row, so I'm very excited. Um, but this time, I had the opportunity to work with Ms. Galloway in this research. Um, so do you want to just give a bit of a background on yourself? Yeah, basically, I'm a security researcher. I work in California. And I present last year here in Troopers about Samsung Pay, tokenization numbers, flaws and issues. Um, basically, that's I okay. am. <laughs> so what we're going to do, I'll give an introduction about myself. So I work for a company called Positive Technologies, and I'm the cybersecurity resilience lead there, which probably doesn't tell you that much about my job. Uh, but I'll leave it at that for now. So what we're going to do first is we're going to give you a bit of an introduction as to how payments work at quite an abstract level. And then we're going to talk about some of the research that has influenced us doing this work. So talk about some researchers who are influential in NFC and also about some projects which relate to the work that we've been doing. After that, we'll show you how to carry out NFC emulation and we'll go into some demonstrations around relay and replay attacks. So first of all, um, why would we clone transactions over cloning a card? The simple answer is it's much easier. It's really scalable. So if you're an attacker, it's relatively simple to get hold of multiple transactions. And actually, tokens have quite a, a long lifetime associated with them. So NFC is a short-range technology, wireless technology, and it has, has many applications. So we're quite familiar with it used in things like transport. So most of us use things like the metro every day. We're used to using it there. Sometimes it's used in healthcare to track patient information, and it's also used in social media through NFC tags. But specifically for this talk, we're only focusing around its application to banking wallets. So a little history on NFC adoption. So originally it was adopted by the UPASS in Korea, which was quite a long time ago. And then in 2004, we saw the formation of the NFC Forum, which now consists of a lot of manufacturers and banks as well. And after some trial runs, MasterCard produced its PayPass in 2005. And then we saw in 2006 actually the first implementation of NFC in a phone, which was a Nokia clamshell design, believe it or not. Um, it wasn't until 2015 that we actually saw the rollout of many of the wallets that we're very familiar with using today. And now um, around 40% of non-cash transactions are attributed to, to NFC. The value is still quite low, so most transactions are around the 7 to 10 euro mark. So this data flow diagram is just to give you an idea of what actually happens when a transaction takes place. And you can see that it's quite a lengthy post process. So EMV contactless is now the standard for any debit or credit card that has an NFC interface. Um, and it has a couple of different modes for all the card brands, and that's just to allow it for backwards compatibility with older terminals. And then while NFC is the technology that allows contactless payments to take place, tokenization is the process that imparts a level of security to this. So what happens is when you sign up for a wallet, the first thing that happens is actually your number is replaced with a virtual representation of your card number, and the original card number is stored in a token vault. And what this means is you're less likely to be subject to fraud, and the whole process is meant to be insured by a cryptogram. But in reality, we see that the lifetime of tokens can be quite long. So this whole process is implemented through things like secure element and host card emulation. And you're quite, probably quite familiar with these terms, but you may be less familiar with the actual differences in these technologies. Secure Element has been around for quite a long time, and it's a physical hardware component that exists on the device. And so we've seen many manufacturers option, op opting for this option. But, but due to the complexity of payment environments, actually in some geographic locations, it's been quite difficult to get off the ground. Host card emulation is much more of a newer technology, 
And the idea with this is the card emulation still happens on the device, but the supposed secure element exists in the cloud. This presents a couple of security issues. And the way in which um, host card emulation gets around this is it provides the device itself with limited lifetime keys and also limited lifetime tokens. But this also allows the device to carry out transactions offline. So what you see with this process, these technologies, as we've moved from quite a deterministic security approach where we know exactly what exists in the device, we know what the, the hardware is, exactly what the component is, to more of a risk-based model. And just a reminder with NFC, a lot of people assume that the card initiates the transaction, but actually it's the terminal, that, terminal that's initiating the transaction. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about why it's so attractive as a fraud vector. So there's a few things. So obviously there's a, there's a, a low limit associated with contactless. There's no significant cardholder verification. So that makes it very attractive. But actually, there's also quite, quite a few places where they have higher limits within country. So if you travel or if you were to compromise or get hold of a token, you could use it in another country where the limit is lower, but actually the card's limit is higher. Additionally, um, banks typically accept this as a risk. So they consider any fraud around NFC payments to be an acceptable risk for them just because of the low values associated with them. What else is interesting is there's a number of really simple attack vectors. For example, you can carry out a transaction um, milliseconds apart. So for example, if you were a fraudster, you could have a fraudulent merchant terminal and you can swipe a card quite quickly across multiple terminals and it will be accepted. But having said all of this, in reality, we've only seen a couple of confirmed cases in the wild. Um, so there was a confirmation by SC staff as to an attack vector that had occurred. But I think a lot of the reasons for this is that often in security, when we're talking about new attack vectors, we see that it takes quite a, a long time to see confirmation of this. But when we're talking to banks, from our own experience, we've talked about these attack vectors, and they are genuinely concerned about them. So we'll expect to see that these attack vectors become more common in the future. So this leads us on to talking a little bit about previous research that is influential to this work. So I want to talk a little bit about Michael Rowland, and then we're going to talk about Peter Fillmore and a couple of other research projects. So Michael Rowland's work has been really influential in um, the work of looking at MasterCard specifically, and he found a couple of key findings, one of which is that uh, one of the dynamic pieces of information that you would need to generate to create a fraudulent attack um, in some cases, that was predictable. So in some cases, the unpredictable number is predictable, or you can actually force the value for that to zero. Peter Fillmore built upon this work, and he focused more around Visa. And he found that it's quite important in terms of carrying out fraudulent attacks that you put the transaction into magstripe mode. And the benefit of this is a couple of things. In EMV mode, you have the card signing the transaction, so there's a lot more security around the transaction itself. If you can put the transaction into magstripe mode, what you have is a lot of static information, um, so it's a much less secure mode. And the way in which you do this is the card responds to the terminal with a value in the application interchange profile. So this leads us on to a couple of projects which really inspired this work. The first was a piece at DEF CON 20 um, by Mr. Lee, and he produced what's really a relatively simple setup. So two Android phones, he used NFC proxy and Cyanogen, which is now an outdated variant of Android. And he showed that you could carry out a relay attack over public Wi-Fi. There's a couple of issues with this project is that, unfortunately, it doesn't work in that way anymore. There's been quite a number of changes to Android, and you can't, for example, use NFC proxy as the default application um, for NFC on Android. 
And there's a few other tools available to do similar things, but none of them work in this particular mode. There was a more recent project as well. So last year, there was a demonstration by two researchers which showed a private prototype. And whilst this is um, a really nice design, some of, the, um, some of the issues with this particular work that we had is that we felt that the community, the security community, couldn't learn that much from this kind of a project. And we felt that it was necessary to demonstrate that you can carry out these attack vectors using hardware that anyone can buy. So this leads us on to our section where we're going to do some demonstrations, and Salvador is going to take over. Thank you. So we're going to talk about the NFC emulation. Basically, it's one of the features of NFC. The other ones are written and writer and also peer-to-peer -peer communications. Basically, we're going to talk a little bit about the ACR-122, which is the USB reader that we want to implement for this tech, uh, for the demos, basically. You can use it with any kind of hardware if you put it at uh, emulation mode. To do that, you need to initialize it as a target. Uh, they have a lot of information in data sheet and internet how you can um, initialize a target to um, basically you are behaving as a car credit card reader. These uh, are some of the comments that we have in the Adam Lurie library, which basically it helps a lot to initialize, initialize this NFC reader into the emulation mode. We're going to implement this specific Python script for all our research, but uh, we made so many changes to integrate the SDR connection. Let's talk a little bit about the replay attack, basically what it is. Uh, basically, my malicious, malicious user can intercept a transaction while the original user couldn't make the transaction in the POS. Basically, he can capture the token and replay it later implementing any kind of tool. And specifically, we're going to use this tool. We say a project, very cheap project, which implements a Raspberry Pi Zero, a ACR-122, a LiPo 3.7 volts, and a zero LiPo booster. Basically, the, the booster, what it does is increments the 3.7 volts to 5 volts. Some of the characteristics of this project is that it's portable. Basically, you have a reader and emulator simultaneously. Uh, and it's a Wi-Fi co connectivity. You implement the Raspberry Pi Zero W, and of course, it's customizable. So let's try to make a demo with this one. So um, it's a small device that you can bring with you, and you have the LiPo on the top of it. Basically, what I'm trying to do is try and demo intercepting a token from um, Android Pay, in this case, Google Pay, and um, replay it using a, another a smartphone as POS. Mm, interesting. Let's wait a little bit, probably it's um, rebooting system. There you go. So, by the we implement the RFA idiot library to do this um, attack. I don't know, you can turn this side of the screen so we can try to intercept the token. Please, can you write it for me? Yes, uh, click enter on it. So basically what I'm going to try to do is, uh, it's going to go to the emulator mode, and it's going to capture the token. Can you switch to another screen? <coughs> so at this time, I got the token and this device, and it's all ready to replay it. In this case, when I press the JS mode, basically what it does, it's just going to create a Visa Max Stripe data NFC card, integrating the contactless smart card in this small device. So yes, press the W. Can you change the mode to, uh, um, please, thank you. Oh. Can you? Uh, it was okay. Okay. 
We're going to play the demo by the video, so I think it's going to be easier. Yeah. So basically, uh, I have the Android phone here. I'm, in, I'm running the Google Pay, the new version of Android Pay. I have in the same device. Basically, I intercept the token, implementing the NF copy. Um, this token, and specifically, implements a Cloud Create program, which means uh, it's available to make a transaction. Basically, instead of getting all the data from the first NFC communication, I just create an MSD, contactless card emulation. After that, it's going to authorize in the transaction, and after that, it's going to bend in the product. So talking about relay attacks, which are more interesting, basically it's a man in the middle attack where one malicious user can intercept the communication and change some kind of parameters. It could be the APD use, or even it could be the protocol between the two devices. One of the inconvenience of this attack are the delays, the timeouts, but Michael Roland specifies that the limit of the transaction is 500 milliseconds, but the payment terminal is not required to interrupt the transaction even if it takes longer, which means it could take even until four seconds, let's say, to make the transaction and the terminal is not going to cancel that transaction. This is a project that I implement for this um, relay attack. Basically, it's Raspberry Pi, a serial LiPo, all the, all the old components for another project, but we integrate this CC1101, which is a cheap trans receiver. This is some of the characteristics of this trans receiver, that you, how you can implement it. You can use the different frequencies um, and the modulations, the, the file is the GFSK, and also the price you can find very, very cheap and eBay, for example. Some of the connections for this small device is that you barely you can connect it to the SPI connector in the Raspberry Pi very quickly. Just you enable the SPI in the Raspberry configuration. And some of the dependencies is the Warren Pi library, and a specific library that this guy is PCTD create for CC1101 for Raspberry Pi. Instead of having all the cables around, we designed this a small PCB, so you just can plug and play the device on the top of the Raspberry Pi. Some of the limitations for the relay attack also inside of the library is that you have to, to put a payload from, C, from one to six device, which means, for example, some IPD use commands are around 200. Basically, you need to make chunks of the payload to have enough time, or I mean, to have enough space to communicate with another SDR. So some of the characteristics of this project is that you have two NFC readers and emulators. They interchange NFC uh, reader and emulator simultaneously. You have Wi-Fi wi connectivity. It's custom customizable, cheap. Uh, of course, you have SDR support to have a direct connection. So we're going to play a demo, or let's try it, let's try it, let's try it demo. So we're going to just play the demo, and we're going to try it. Let's try it demo. So basically, let's use this very. So I'd just like to mention that, as with most presentations, we're not 100% sure if this is going to work. <laughs> so. So basically, we have um, two, two Raspberry Pis. Oh, and then presentation. So basically, we have two Raspberry Pis. One is going to behave like a POS, point of system, and another one is going to behave as a credit card reader, basically. Mm. 
Let's we'll spray the demos. You sure? Yeah. Oh, there you go. It's just too much pressure, to be honest. <laughs> All right. So basically, you can take this one. Yeah. Make it as well. Right. Basically, what we're going to try to do is, I have a POS or a phone that is going to simulate a POS system, and Galloway has a credit card read credit card that we're going to try to implement a relay attack using these two devices. So I'm going to run it seems that I don't have a connection. <laughs> Let's Yeah. So we're gonna try again. Just keep it Close to the terminal. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to play demos. <laughs> yeah. Someone is jamming our signal. <laughs> yeah. So basically, this is a demo. I have um, the same POS on one side of my, my computer. I'm running the, I'm getting the data between the two nodes. The another, the another um, SDR is another side of the alley, basically. Uh, you can see it's a long distance between one side and another to move the connection, I mean to move the, the data between both of them. So basically, um, what, we, what we want to show you is that you can implement chip hardware to these kind of attacks. Another attack that is not, is not in the description of our attack was how to strike data from chip and pin core with NFC. Basically, a malicious user can implement the same APD layer to strike data from chip and pin cards using NFC connections. What I mean with that, uh, the contact card and the contactless card, they implement the same APD layer, which means are the same commands to interchange communication. For this project, uh, instead of using the ACR122, in another side, we implement the USB smart card reader. So basically, the main change between these two projects adds just a protocol. Instead of zero, it changes for one, which means you are going to implement it in a different way. So we're going to play a demo. Basically, you have the car connected to one of the Sentinelas, and it's going to send the implementing SDR to another Sentinela. But in this one, we are using NFC. Basically, the attacks between relays are for protocols, chip to chip or NFC to NFC. But in this case, we're extracting data for a chip admin car <coughs> with NFC technology. This. Um, this given introduction to this attack, relay for replay. This is not really very well documented. Basically, what I'm talking about this is about the secure element, which basically when you uh, capture a transaction from, from let's say, a Fibit Ionic, which is one of those new devices for to make uh, payments. Um, basically, if you capture the transaction and try to replay it in another POS terminal, the transaction is going to be declined because the cryptogram. We analyzed a little bit about the cryptogram, which basically is the 1F20 seat, and the 9F30 seat is the transaction counter. The main idea here is when you try to make a, re a replay to, with this transaction, when the POS terminal sends a challenge, and you respond with the same cryptogram, the POS terminal is going to tell you that it's a wrong cryptogram, and it's going to cancel the transaction, and it's going to be a fraudulent transaction. What I found was that some of the secure elements data are static, but the only thing that is changing are the cryptogram application, application transaction counter. What a malicious user can do 
is to save this transaction, but make a smart relay just sending the cryptogram and the application transa transaction and the next transaction, basically. Instead of sending 200 bytes in the SDR, you can send just 20 bytes, which, uh, which includes the cryptogram and the application transaction counter. So basically the steps is, someone is new a transaction, it couldn't go through the first transaction, doesn't matter. The main point here is to get the data from the transaction, and after that, make a smart relay. Basically, you can create an array with all the data of the transaction and put it together when you're going to make the relay, just put in um, the cryptogram and the, application, the new application transaction. To explain a little bit more, basically, when the POS asks for the file directory, um, the same computer responds with that data. After that, the POS responds with what is the ID, in this case, it's Visa card, and also the computer responds for that. But when it requests the cryptogram, instead of responding, the, the computer is sent the signal to another computer, and it, it gets, in this case, the new cryptogram application an application counter. So basically, to understand a little bit more, the POS asks for the PPCA, it responds with the AID. Uh, request the information for the Visa ID, and it sends the, the, uh, the, the answer, SFI, which is the PDO. And after that, it sends the challenge. In this case, the Sentinel-1 connects to Sentinel-2 and gives the challenge to the secure element and responds back, and that sent back to the POS, the POS. So we're going to play a demo of this one. Basically, I have the transaction in the, my computer. You can see the array on the bottom. And in this particular case is that this Fitbit Ionic watch with secure element, it could be Apple Pay, let's say. And instead of sending all the data back and forward, I'm just sending back the cryptogram and the application, application transaction counter. And it validated the transaction I went through. So let's talk a little bit about new technology. Uh, basically, the new technology that we're having in the in the cars, on the new to future cars, is this secure car access. Some of these new secure car access that are going to implement NFC technology, which, has, which one of the main points here is that they are going to have the same kind of flaws that we can exploit them. That's a good question to answer. I request some of these uh, boards for the company, and I didn't get any answer. So now we're going to talk about the countermeasures. So in terms of some of the countermeasures for these attacks, one possible solution is that you introduce an additional form of verification just to show that the uh, cardholder is actually present at the terminal. But obviously the problem with introducing an additional factor is that you're degrading the user experience. And one of the biggest benefits of contactless payments is that it's just so simple for a user to interact with. There's a few other countermeasures that are possible for things like relay attacks. So with relay attacks, it's natural to think that it, the transaction should take a much longer time. So it should be possible to determine that a relay attack is taking, being taken place just by looking at the timing of the transaction. One of the challenges with this, unfortunately, is that um, at the moment, at least from the testing that we've done, is that a lot of readers allow you to take much longer than the 500 milliseconds that was described earlier by Salvador. And in order to actually implement um, a proper countermeasure, it would require dedicated hard hardware in all new terminals, creating a dedicated RF channel. So given that NFC uh, fraud is considered an acceptable risk by banks, we don't really see them adopting these kind of countermeasures anytime soon. So that concludes our talk, and we just wanted to remind you that some of the um, Attacks that we've demonstrated here can be used, can be carried out by anyone. You can buy the hardware pretty easily. You can start off just by using a phone. And uh, some of the simpler attacks we demonstrated with hardware that cost around 60 euros. And like with any research, research is normally incremental upon other people's work. So we just wanted to make a few credits to other people who've been working in this specific space. And if you have any questions, then please let us know.